Singing Dutchman Productions. Hello and welcome to Doug's Front Porch, a podcast where I get to sit down with friends old and new and have honest conversations. Today, I welcome Lawrence Morris to the front porch, someone that I've only recently got to know, uh, but he I find his story so fascinating and he's just a really neat guy and I wanted to have him up in the front porch and he said, I'll do it. So welcome to the show, Lawrence. <laughs> Thanks so much, Doug. Glad to join you and uh, glad to be here with your listeners. Well, Lawrence, I start every episode out with uh, giving the uh, listeners an opportunity to learn a little bit of like your background. So tell us where you were born. Uh, Maybe something interesting about your childhood. Did you have brothers or sisters? Were you interested in something? You know, did you play a sport or did you have some weird hobby or (laughs) kind of like set the foundation for who Lawrence Morris is today? (laughs) Great. Well, I I was born in New Jersey. Um, and I, somehow I don't view myself as a New Jersey person, though, because we weren't rooted in New Jersey. My mother was from the West Coast. She had grown up in, um, in a small town. It was a small town then called Tacoma uh, outside of Seattle in Washington State. And her, her father he had a variety of jobs. But uh, one thing he really loved to do was have a really small farm. So he loved uh, to um, raise animals and especially birds. He would have peacocks. He would take them to the county fair. So she had come east from Seattle when she was just after college. And she worked for companies in New York as a librarian, as a business librarian. And then she got married to my father. But my father's side hadn't been in um, here long either. So his parents had been immigrants from Ireland to the United States. And he was the first generation then in uh, born in the U.S. and, and born in um, in, in New Jersey. So none of them were like necessarily real kind of East Coast people. They were both in some sense had one foot at least in a different part of, of the country or, or even the world. And that was even true on, on my on my mother's side. So, you know, going way back, there were Irish on all sides in that time period. You know, Irish would marry Irish or, or maybe if they were um, naughty, they'd marry an Italian, but uh, for the most part, they they, they kept it in, in the group. So, um, I had a very strong Irish American identity, for example, and uh, so grew up with a sense of being not just American, but also having a, another cultural heritage. And um, my mother, my my mother was the last of five children. And spread across a a fair amount of of time. And um, her mother, so my grandmother, was actually born in the the later 1800s. So that spans quite a long time now, 100 years between my grandmother born and and, and today. And my grandmother was raised by her grandparents because, unfortunately, my grandmother's mother um, died in childbirth with some siblings of of my grandmother. Um, So she was raised by her grandparents as a result. And uh, her grandfather had actually fought in the Civil War. So it it feels that (laughs) that kind of chain that the... um, the people who gave my grandmother love were in the Civil War. In some way, it kind of blows my mind that you can kind of stretch back with just a few faces uh, to a what feels like a very different time and space. Um, but they were actually Irish immigrants as well. So they spoke Irish. And, and, and like many languages, as often you see in Pennsylvania Dutch as well, some of the older generation in that time in the States, you know, they would speak Irish amongst themselves. They speak Irish Gaelic amongst themselves but not so much with uh, children. And so my grandmother grew up a- as a passive speaker of Irish Gaelic, for example. And she only passed on one phrase to my mother, which of all phrases, um, it wasn't even a swear. If it were Pennsylvania Dutch, it would have been a swear word. Um, but it was, um, it was do the doris, which means shut the door. I'm not sure what about that phrase became so terribly important to be passed on. Well, that was the one phrase of Irish Gaelic that my mother had grown up with um, from my from my grandmother's passive ability in Irish. 
Um, so that's a little bit about my my kind of background, probably more than you, you want to know. But I was always interested in languages, and I think that's why I bring up the story a bit. So so um, uh, even a child, although there were no uh, f uh, languages in my school besides English or taught in my in my grammar school, I was I learned a bit of German, for example, just out of curiosity. I, I learned a bit of Irish um, as well uh, through studies, and that developed later on. And and so today I, I'm involved in, in several different languages. But I think it all began with that with that one phrase that my grandmother had preserved of Duna Doris, shut the door. I suppose I've been opening the door since. <laughs> Can I, I, I have a great follow-up question then for you. So you grew up um, having this uh, this sense of an identity uh, that tied a little bit to language, as you said, with Irish. Um, did you see that as a, as a major part of who you were, even as a kid? Or is that something maybe that developed as you got older? I, I mean, I think language, you mean language in particular or identity? Well, call, I mean, you, you it sounds like you had a lot of Irish culture surrounding you, you know, or Irish American culture, which I'm sure is different from, you know, Irish, Irish culture. But, um, do you, you know, thinking back to even high school age, Lawrence, were you, did you identify with that? Or was that a part of like who you were? Definitely. I mean, we were still in the generation, you know, where people identify themselves by their ethnicities in that way, you, you know, so-and-so was Irish, so-and-so was Italian, so-and-so was Polish. And I think as I got older, it actually, it, it, it changed so much because you go from what were very relatively insular ethnic communities. And then as air travel became, you know, in, in my lifetime, air travel became so much easier. And, um, Going to Ireland, for example, and seeing how different Ireland is, the Ireland of today uh, is from the Ireland of my grandmother. I mean, they're, they're not the same country at all. And, and the country, the, the customs uh, that my grandmother's parents and that my own, on uh, my father's side, his parents brought over. I mean, that's a, they're the customs of a different country. Um, than what Ireland is today. And I think that gives a sense of kind of, of, of culture shock in, in a way. You, you, when you first go over there, you think, well, I, I, should, I should know something about this place. But you, you, you know something about what that place was like 80 years ago. <laughs> and um, I think that, that creates, in, in some sense, that, that makes perhaps your identity more, more accurate. And you realize that it's... Uh, Irish American is its own thing. It's neither. It's certainly not Irish, and it's nor is it necessarily mainstream generic American either. It's it, it's its own thing with its own history, and its and its own inflection, um, and, and that's a useful experience. Can I ask then, just out of curiosity, how do you view St. Patrick's Day? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I certainly love St. Patrick's Day, uh, and, and we always did. I mean, we always, you know, we celebrated it, you know, wholesomely, I would say, with uh, soda bread and, uh, well, little, little uh, leprechauns and the other kind of um, decorations you get in, in America. Um, I'm not a particularly big drinker, so I, I, I've, I've never been into the overindulging aspect, at least not since my college days of St. Patrick's Day. Um, so, I, and in some ways that kind of distorts the culture, isn't it? Um, to, to focus just on that one aspect of it. But, um, uh, so I certainly enjoy it, but perhaps not the stereotypical part of it. So let's segue. You, uh, you graduate high school, you go off to college and you decide at some point that you want to study. Well, tell everybody what you studied and like where your interests were. And, and given what you just told us, I think I'm going to I understand better why, because that was one of my questions that I had going into this. Like whatever, because I know what you got into. And I was wondering, like, what why would any you know what made you do that? But go ahead. Tell the listeners, please. Um, well, you know, I actually studied um, uh, classics, Latin and Greek in undergraduate. And um, then in graduate school, uh, people, people might not know, but I'm a professor at Albright College. I'm an English professor at Albright College, and I teach a, well, a wide range of courses. I teach, you know, basic writing. I teach um, courses in Irish literature, such as Yeats. Uh, and I also teach a course on Pennsylvania Dutch uh, culture and history, which is how I got to know you and, and other people in the um, Pennsylvania Dutch community. Um, and it's a long road to that place though. I started off as a classicist. I did Latin and Greek. When I was in high school, I studied Latin and Greek and then I 
continued that on for my major. Uh, then for, um, and that was down in Washington, D.C. I was at Catholic University. And uh, then for my uh, MA and PhD, I went to Harvard and I studied um, um, comparative literature. And comparative literature is where you basically do three different languages and three different literatures and kind of think about think about literature, not just in the narrow confines of one particular nation, but as a much larger entity. And um, in my case, I was working once again, primarily with Irish Gaelic in that case, with Latin and with English. I was a medievalist primarily as a, as a graduate student. Um, and I won't go all the different roads, but eventually I made my way to Albright College. And after being there for a few years as a transplant to Berks County and having done a lot of work with Irish Gaelic, um, I became interested in, in the smaller language right here in Berks County, which is Pennsylvania Dutch, you know, an, an, an ancient language spoken by a minority Indo-European. Its folklore actually has a lot of overlap with, with Irish folklore as being a European um, folk culture. And uh, so that's how I got interested in Pennsylvania Dutch things, because it, it's, you know, it's really hard to, to fly to Ireland, even though, you know, air travel is so much easier than it used to be. Still, that's 3000 miles away, whereas we have a, a really fascinating, rich folk culture here in Berks County that is worth studying. And that's how I got interested in Pennsylvania Dutch materials is by being a transplant. We're going to come back to the Pennsylvania Dutch thing, but I, I want to keep going down this Irish vein. Uh, so the language Irish Gaelic. Now, there's a lot of people out there that maybe don't realize that this language still exists. Um, give like a quick like your elevator pitch on uh, what is Irish Gaelic? Like, How many people still speak it today? What is Ireland doing to save it or promote it or aren't they? Um, kind of hit those like, you know, the elevator pitch on Irish Gaelic. And then please give us a little Irish Gaelic so the listeners can hear it. Oh, I, I love to. That, that sounds great. So Irish Gaelic is not at all like English. So sometimes people have the misconception that Irish Gaelic is English with uh, with an Irish accent. And that's not the case. Um, Irish Gaelic is a completely different language. It belongs to a language family called uh, Celtic. So it's not even the same language family as English. Uh, and it sounds very different. So, for example, you know, just to choose a simple phrase in English, like I have a book in English, in Irish Gaelic, that phrase is taliauragam, taliauragam. You can't even hear, there's no connection at all. You can't really um, hear um, any resemblance between the two languages. Or just to take, a, take a, um, another phrase, let's say, you know, um, the moon is shining in English. In Irish, that's taliauragam. So there's no real overlap at all, completely different languages. In terms of numbers, it really depends upon um, who you count as a speaker. And this is kind of an interesting phenomenon that's often the case with some smaller languages at times. Um, if you count people who grew up speaking Irish Gaelic as their first language, so what normally we would call native speakers of Irish, at these days, we're probably down to about 50 or 60,000 people in Ireland who grew up speaking Irish as their first language. But um, Irish is heavily supported by the state. Uh, um, and every school child in the Republic of Ireland, for example, will take Irish Gaelic from when they enter to when they leave. Um, and this is about as successful as your average math classes in America. So um, some kids in America finish grade school with a really strong arithmetic and many kids in America finish grade school with not so strong arithmetic. And the same is the case with Irish Gaelic. Some kids will finish um, their, their mandatory Irish with uh, strong Irish um, and other kids, um, well, hardly know a few, a few phrases is the extent of it. So if you include all those speakers though who learned Irish in school and are, and are fairly competent and enjoy going to the occasional cultural events in Irish, like a book reading or a concert um, with Irish language music, then the numbers increase dramatically. And then we're talking about, well, maybe 400,000 people who are able to speak Irish Gaelic in a competent level. So the number you choose is, you know, is anywhere between that, between, let's say, 50,000 to 500,000. It's a tremendous difference, but we're talking about uh, perhaps different connections to the language, certainly different um, relationships with the language, different abilities in the language. And um, 
so that's a very that's a it's a its own unique kind of position. It's both a state endorsed language, it's heavily supported in the school system, but one that as a native language is losing ground with with every generation. And you you think that trend is going to continue that the number of speakers will continue to decrease? Yeah, I mean the number of native speakers, well, I may perhaps I'm a pessimist, but I think that it, it is bound to happen. Uh, with Irish now is and has been for a couple of generations is surrounded by English absolutely everywhere. So the communities uh, are the far west coast where the, the ones that have lasted the longest is Irish speaking communities, where it's the native language, where you walk into the pub and everyone will be able to speak Irish, where, you know, the first words talk with your cousin are in Irish. Um, those communities are, are small villages on the west coast. But even in those villages, you know, you get the summer house phenomenon where, you know, lots of wealthy people from the neighboring cities will move in, buy summer houses. Some of them will even put down roots there. And then you have little English enclaves throughout. And every child who's, who's Irish learns English very quickly from TV and other factors. So there's just so much pressure on Irish um, Gaelic that it, it's hard to imagine it. Um, as a native language lasting much longer. And this isn't any kind of due to any kind of lack of desire or lack of commitment. This is just a very natural language form, right? Languages for communicating. When you have to communicate with someone and you, you know they don't speak um, Irish or you know they don't speak Irish well, and you speak English really well, well, you turn to English to get the job done. And then who you fall in love with is different. And it all it all changes from there. So once there's a heavy presence of, of English in the community, it's I guess my pessimistic self thinks it's, 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 it's bound to um, go down. Um, let me just plug in my computer. My wire is about to expire, my, my battery. Let me for that. All right, all good. Now I want to disappear magically. Uh, I do have uh, so a nerd question for you with languages. Um, what do you find Irish to be? And you know, you've learned multiple languages. Is Irish a a difficult language, or I'm you know, all languages have their difficulties. And and but what can you say about the Irish language? Is it was it really difficult to get the sound right, or is the grammar really difficult? Uh, what can you say about that? I think most English speakers do find it to be a difficult language. The, the sound system is quite different. Um, most consonants, for example, can be said in um, two basic ways. One way is called broad and one way is called um, slender. I'll give you an example. Um, like in Irish, this is a common example, the difference between a, a, a broad B and a slender B. We have a word that's bow and we have a word that's bio. They're, they're pretty similar, right? Bo and bio. The other one is almost like it's followed by a Y. Um, one means cow uh, and the other one means alive. So um, they can mean dramatically different things. So some people find that difficult. Um, Irish also has this thing of um, mutations where the beginning of the word changes depending upon its grammatical context. So for example, if you say, um, I will put my pen on the table, you start with the verb, and the word for put is basically coulda, coulda. But if you're going to say, I won't put, you say, ni coulda. So you change the coulda to a coulda. That's not too too far off. Um, but then if you say, am I going to put? You would say, a gooda. And that C sound changes to a G sound. So from coulda becomes gooda. So people take, it takes a lot of people a lot of, a while to figure that out. In English, we're very used to tacking things on the end, right? We don't mind saying running, runs, um, or even runs, right? All that sounds fine to us. Um, but changing the start of uh, words is, is foreign to English speakers. And uh, it takes a little while to, to kind of gel that into place, those changes. And, and, and the words change in different ways. So in the case of coulda, like the question form becomes gooda. But in, the, in a word like, let's say, better, the question form is mera, they all change in a different pattern. And this can be quite difficult for English speakers. So I noticed on your, we'll change gears a little bit. Uh, I noticed on your faculty website uh, at Albright there that it said, if it's old, Dr. Morris probably teaches it. So 
you know, you got interested in your graduate level studies in medieval literature. What was yeah. it about the Middle Ages that drew you there? And what is it about old stuff that 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 keeps that keeps you coming back? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I'm not sure I know entirely myself. You know, if uh, sometimes I think I would have been happier in the in the 19th century country if it weren't for all the disease and poverty and slavery you know a, a, a cleaned up version of the 19th century um would attract me um i used to joke with my nerd friends that you know, i was becoming more modern as time went on i started off in the ancient world the classics and i become a medievalist and you know by the end of my life i would be a modernist um as the situation developed um i suppose uh, what attracts me to those, those older things uh, um, I, I think in, in, in part, it's a, it is a kind of romanticized idea of the past. And uh, one has the luxury of, of molding the past to look like you kind of wish it did instead of the reality of it. Uh, I, I think this is part of the reason why people play things like Dungeons and Dragons or um, engage in other kinds of um, historical reenactment. There's a, a certain sense of... Um, of a fun dabbling in a way that's also safer. You know, if you're a person, the modern, if, if you're a person who, who loves the political commentary of, on Twitter, this for me would be much too stressful uh, to talk about things that affect policy right now. And uh, even though the past informs the present, even though the past tells us important uh, lessons, I think I fundamentally feel a little bit more comfortable uh, and, 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 uh, having that slight remove. So not to put you on the spot, but I am going to put you on the spot anyway, um, given, you know, what you teach. Um, and I know you're not in the high school setting, but even if you run into a parent or a high school student and they say to you, why in God's name do I need to read Jeffrey Chaucer? Or, you know, what, why, why is it so important? that I need to see the Canterbury Tales? What does that, what, what does that do for me? And it's a tough question, of course. You know, I get asked those types of questions as a teacher too. But what's your response to somebody that might say, oh, seriously, you know, this stuff's a thousand years old. What do I need? Why do I need to read this in 2022? Yeah. Um, it, and, and it's a good question. It's a valid question, right? When, when students are thinking about the, their time and, and their money, they want to make informed choices about doing that. And I'll be honest, I'm not sure it's right for everybody to do it. Uh, I, I'm okay with that. I'm, I, I'm not uh, going to force it on people who don't want it. But the past and the literature of the past, it really has amazingly so many of the themes we have today, right? If we look at Chaucer, it has sex, it has violence, it has religion, it has both positive religion and religious corruption, it has charlatans, it has truth tellers, and none of that's changed, right? That, that might as well be the world we are in today, and that teaches us something I think important about the human condition, about the human spirit, um, and we can relate to these issues here and, and in some ways, in, in a way that feels a little bit safer because it's not quite so politicized as the present moment in time. Um, but human beings, in, in terms of their emotions, in terms of their hopes, in terms of their desires, have changed surprisingly little. Maybe our technology has changed, but what we, what we want to do with that technology to create stories, to find partners, to um, let the world know who we are. That was the same thing that drove Chaucer to write his manuscripts. He was he wasn't he wasn't using Facebook or TikTok. He was using um, parchment and wax tablets. But it's the same phenomenon to tell a story that reaches others. And if we the difficulty, of course, is that he writes in a language that now is hard for us to understand. And we have to put in the effort, um, the kind of linguistic effort to read Middle English. Or I often teach uh, Beowulf, which is an old English, which is essentially a, a foreign language. And so students have to do a, a lot more language work just reading Beowulf. Um, but Beowulf is a story of um, political dynasty, of empire, of control, of selflessness, 
of heroism, of self-sacrifice, all kinds of things that are still so vitally important and discussed in America and around the entire world today. Um, a little bit of language work and we can kind of uncover a common humanity and learn about ourselves and about others. I think it's, well, I love to do it. And I know many of my students also enjoy doing it, but you know, every once in a while, some don't and that's okay too. I guess the question is from an education perspective, um... How do you keep something that old fresh? How how do you get those points across to that, you know, 19-year-old freshman or 20-year-old sophomore sitting in your class? Yeah, it's um well, first you have to take time uh, because students, some students at least, they just they just want to rush. They kind of want to even even the good ones maybe want to just read the book as fast as they possibly can. And we miss so much when we do that. So I think a, an important part of the literature classroom is slowing down and making sure that we savor the words on the page, especially, you know, when we're teaching literature, what we're teaching is an art form and it's a, it's a very precise uh, art form, right? Chaucer, when he's, when he's putting his words in iambic pentameter, rhymed couplets, he is spending hours on a page for sure. And if we just read it for plot, we miss so much of that. So step one is just to sit down, relax, take some time and think about what he's actually saying it and how he's saying it, what aspects he's trying to bring out through his word choice, through his juxtaposition, his use of imagery. And um, it, it, it's, it's difficult work. Yeah, I was going to say, given how fast society is today, yeah. do you, is that something your students, I'm sure that, I, I, I know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway, that they struggle with? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, they definitely struggle with, with slowing down. I mean, I, I, students today, I, I think they have two, two big struggles. One is trying to get everything done fast. And uh, I think we also see are starting to increasingly see a crisis in, in confidence, though. Students now, um, when they have an obstacle, find it so hard to overcome that obstacle. Um, and, and often they'll have been successful in, in their in their high school careers. And then they come into the college and they don't have quite the same safety net. Um, mom and pop aren't there helping them stay on track. And they, they meet obstacles, they become depressed, or they, there's something they don't understand. And they find it really hard to overcome that. I, I think that's one of the things we're really working on in, in, in colleges today, is trying to support those students to, to face those challenges. So they want to get these things done quickly. And when they can't, they feel frustrated, they feel like a failure. And um, that's a lot of emotional work we have to do in, in the classroom. Um, and I, I'm sure you, I, I imagine you're facing that in the high schools as well. I was just going to say, I mean, it, it's really interesting that you said all that. These are the types of things that I, I and my colleagues talk a lot about because it's the exact same. Uh, and then you couple that with, you know, at the college level, you, you, you aren't getting the entire gamut of society coming through your doors, but you, you, you know, you are facing the things that you're talking about. I'm facing in the high school classroom too. We have kids with confident, major confidence issues. Um, and as soon as they don't get something, they shut down. Well, and, and that is a hurdle all on its own, but now, you know, in the public ed sector, we're also then dealing with uh, issues in the classroom of emotional issues, uh, mental health issues. Um, and then, you know, kids coming from backgrounds where even at the high school level, you know, definitely mom and dad aren't in the picture or they're in the picture, but they're not really interested in the picture. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's something that, and you know, I've, this is my 20th year of education now. And in my 20 years, I've noticed that change. That's probably one of the biggest changes that I've noticed when I think about the kids that I were teaching, that I was teaching at the beginning of my career, and just on the on the on the topic of like confidence, I look at the kids 15 years ago or 20 years ago when I first started, and the kids that I'm dealing with now. Of course, there are some outliers that that are very confident and and can you know that can overcome any hurdle that's thrown at them. But they are becoming increasingly the minority and and rapidly. Um, it, it's it's unbelievable. Like you know, I have kids that like you said are really good in other things. Like they excel at an instrument or an excel at a sport. And 
you know, have won awards and have, have gone on to like districts and regional competitions and all these things. But then as soon as they can't memorize a German verb, they shut down and say, well, I'm stupid. I can't do this. And I'm like, but you know, the ability is there. You have these abilities. I, I don't know what, what has happened over the last, what, however many years that we're creating a, a, a generation or generations with this just absolute lack of self-confidence of go get itness of willing to, you know, understanding that not everything is an easy road in life. And I, it, it's, it's really a, a huge issue that we in public ed are, are facing right now. And, and we don't know what to do either. That's the other thing. Like you're in this situation, we're in this situation and we know that this is happening, but no one can help us figure out how to fix it or how to go about. It. So everybody's kind of like feeling around in the dark. Well, I'm going to try this and I'm going to do this. And, but it's, it's, it's really, really a challenge. And I, I don't want to be the pessimist, but it really worries me for the future in, 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 in yeah. some cases. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it, I guess I, I, I'm, I'm suspecting maybe there, there are, there are trends and, and at some point we're going to reach bottom and <laughs> we're, we're, there's only going to be up after that. Um, but thinking about the resources. Yeah. I mean, I agree at the college level, we don't know what resources there are there. I mean, we, we have a whole set of team. They're called student success specialists. Every freshman has it, uh, has one. They, they reach out to the students on a regular basis. They meet with them one-on-one, -on -one. but, and that's nice, but it's still not the kind of support the students have. And this is, I mean, what they need, they need something internal and it doesn't matter how many external resources you give them. That's not going to cut it. That's not ultimately what they need. And it's hard to, to know where that's coming from. I mean, part of me just thinks, you know, not only are the students busier, but we're busier. Mom and pop are busier. We're, we're doing things and we're trying to be more productive and people are working two jobs and not that they did it in the past, but, you know, structures have changed. Society has changed. Um, and I suspect our generation is a lot less supported at home than, than many of the previous generations. And I think that has, is, is part of it. Um, and, and it, it, it's a missing piece. And, um, well, just two more shop questions for you. Uh, what What is, and I know this is totally putting you on the spot, but what is, I'm going to ask both ways of this question, but I'll start with the negative one first. What is higher ed not doing well right now in America? Oh, that's a great question. What is it not doing well? Well, I don't think higher education has, has figured out its pricing structure for, for starters. <laughs> I think that is, that's a big, uh, problem in, in America. And um, I, I'm not sure what the solution is, but I know that the American system is, is pretty um, complicated uh, and doesn't do our students a, a tremendous service. Um, I'm very familiar also with the British system and, and with the Irish system. Um, the British system is, is more affordable. The loans are more affordable. Um, I think this increases Abil people's ability to pay. Um, but at the same time, when you get these, the British system also is very big institutions, very few of the kind of the small liberal arts colleges that populate Pennsylvania, and which I think do really a really great job. So part of the problem when you have these big kind of institutions that are being state su supported is they are end up being big institutions and that doesn't so suit everybody. Um, but, you know, the college pricing structure in America is insane. Everyone plays a different price. Uh, no two freshmen are paying the same price. It's like a used car lot. And um, that I don't think that's good for the industry. I don't think it's good for students. I, I think we still haven't figured out what a college education actually should be. So many schools are still competing on their baseball field and their gym and their cafeteria and their rock climbing wall and how close the pubs are. And they're not competing on, on what an education is. And I, I think that's a big problem in America as well. Um, people still want college education, or at least many people still want college education to be a either a country club or a, a, a teen movie. And uh, neither of those is really a, what I think anyway, a college education should be. So I think we're doing that pretty poorly. All right, so let's let's end on a good note. What what is higher? What is higher ed doing correctly or doing right? Well, 
you know, in the past um, 25 years, higher education has dramatically increased the opportunities of all Americans, just thinking about the American context, um, from, from all different ethnicities and socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, so just thinking about Albright, the, just the changes I've been there, I've been working there now for, for 15 years. And the time I've been there, we've gone from, you know, a, a, a small school, um, um, a lot of local kids, a lot of kids from New Jersey and um, Maryland and, and New York, but primarily middle class Caucasian. And uh, we're now majority minority. We now have a, a large a Latino population. We have a large a African American population. We have a, a um, socioeconomic bracket that straight, stretches from, from wealthy to um, homeless. And all of these students are getting the same education. And it's not just all by this doing this, it's all sorts of institutions that are doing this in America that are offering a strong education to um, so many more people than would have been the case certainly 50 years ago. And I think that's that's a really good um, stone, a really good foundation stone upon which we can build. Yeah, I agree. And you see it across the board at our, at, you know, the closest um, public university here to where I live, Lock Haven University, their student population has changed over the last, you know, 15, 20 years. So it's, it's public ed, it's private ed. And I, it, it is good to see because um, the country's changing. I mean, the demographics of our country is changing, whether, whether you like it or not. I mean, that's, we have to, you know, it's, yeah. So, yeah. all right. And it's, it's great to see these new populations taking advantage of these educational opportunities. And it, it, in part, it's driven by, you know, once upon a time, you could get a good factory job. And those are so hard to come by now. Higher education has become in some ways the only ticket to a secure future. Uh, so that's driving part of the change as well. You could argue maybe this is a negative thing if we have those factory jobs still, but. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to go back to something we talked about earlier, and that was how you all of a sudden, how you became interested in my culture and language, Pennsylvania Dutch, because I often don't get to talk to too many people that are, that grew up outside the culture, but have like, invested in the culture and in our language. So, and I'd like to pick your brain a little bit. So you, you already mentioned that, you know, this was a local thing that you found, look, I'm here, I'm in this area. Uh, I'm going to explore it more. What about it uh, made you keep coming back? Cause you could have explored a little bit and said, yeah, this isn't for me, uh, you know, uh, but you didn't, you know, you, 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 you dug deeper. What, what about our culture and language made you say, this is cool, or I'm interested in this to go farther. I'm just curious. Yeah, well, you, you know, for me, I, it, strangely enough, I think it is tied into um, Irish material and, and my Irish background, and, and perhaps specifically the context in Ireland. So um, we, we talked a bit about Irish speakers being, you know, on one hand, this tiny majority of 30,000 or 50,000, maybe even not more optimistic, and, then all, and still also 500,000, somewhere in between. Um, but that 500,000, that optimistic number from being in the schools and other places, that was all driven by a, a sense of um, the importance of preserving a language and maintaining a language. Um, and, and so from that, from being involved in, in Irish materials and, and spending a lot of time in, in Ireland and in the Irish speaking communities, I had a kind of a sense of the importance of maintaining small languages and the importance that these small languages have. And then looking around Berks County, of course, I'd say you have two main options. I mean, you could you could go, of course, with um, Spanish or you could go with um, Pennsylvania Dutch. Now, Spanish doesn't need any help on, 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 the, on the global stage, right? The, it, it has, you know, multiple TV channels that you can pick up in, in our county alone. Whereas Pennsylvania Dutch is, is a much is a much smaller uh, language. Um, in some ways, a very similar history to um, to Irish. You know, if, if we think about how Pennsylvania Dutch, you know, it had many storms, but kind of the final cascade beginning in, in the 40s, very similar time in, in Ireland, whereas when Irish Gaelic started to lose ground extremely rapidly is in those 1940s. So a similar history. And I think it's those similarities that made me interested in it. And um, and then exploring it as well, you know, one of the when things I study is folklore. 
And um, so I um, picked up some books on Pennsylvania Dutch folklore and just seeing the similarities between them. I said, well, you know, I, that furthered my interest in wanting to learn more of the language so I could read it in original and look at the documents in the original. So I think it was kind of the, those twin aspects of I enjoy languages. I was like kind of radicalized in Ireland to uh, support small local community languages that are different from English. And um, then the folklore and this kind of shared um, European folklore tradition. I'll just give you an example. You know, um, there is a, um, a, a well in Ireland, a pretty well known um, kind of object in Irish folklore, which is called um, Unfold Marav. And um, sometimes it's translated to English as the stray sod. And in Irish folklore, you'll be out walking in the countryside and you'll step on unfold motive and you'll kind of lose all sense of direction, right? Uh, we won't make any jokes about anyone, but you know, it's, it's that kind of sense. You don't know where you are. And the stories, it's often at nighttime. There's often a joke that maybe they were drinking, but the storyline is that they're walking a place they know very well. In, in, in the Ireland, rural Ireland, there were no lights, but people knew where they were going. They traveled those same roads their entire lives. Um, but they stepped in the full mod of, and then they were completely lost. And usually wander around until either sunlight or cock crow or a neighbor finds them. And then I was reading in, in Brendel's collection of published folk stories, he had something similar. I'm not sure if you ever read, read this particular one, if you ever heard of it, but he had a story of, I think he called it Unfashtan Grok. And it did the exact same thing that if you stepped on this, you lost your way. You didn't know where you were. You were just re roaming around the little cow field that you knew so well and knew where all the gates were and you'd be found by the neighbors in the morning. And so that comparison was really interesting for me. In fact, a, a couple of years ago, I presented a paper at one of the Irish um, folklore conference conferences on that. Because in Ireland, for a long time, they had thought this was a uniquely Irish motif. And I was like, well, hmm, the Pennsylvania Dutch have it also. And once you start digging, you see it in Germany and other places. But uh, so that was a great kind of um, connection between the cultures, seeing those two things. And Ireland, I think it's terribly Irish motif. And you find it right here in Brooks County. <laughs> so as someone that's been working with our culture and our language a little bit, I'll, I'll look into your crystal ball, please. What do you see in your eyes is the future for our, uh, for my culture and language? From that outsider's well, perspective, what do you what do you think? What do you think? Well, um, I mean, the standard answer. I'll give you the standard answer. Is that is that? I'm sure you, you know can give me whatever answer you want, Lawrence. <laughs> your listeners probably know it as well. I mean, in terms of the language, the standard answer is that is thriving amongst the Amish and the Mennonites, and that the traditionally majority population that that were and are Lutheran and German Reformed, UCC, that the language is, is rapidly disappearing um, from that generation with the vast majority of the strong speakers being now in their, in their 80s. Um, and, and that's the standard answer. Um, I'm not sure what that answer really means though, it, it, in some sense, right? If we think about Berks County, for example, I'm um, one of my um, good uh, friends is an old order Mennonite, right? Obviously speaks Pennsylvania Dutch as, as his native language. But he, he grew up in Berks County. His, his, his father was one of the first to move to the settlement in, in Berks County. And he remembers lots of the old timers and speaking, speaking Dutch with the old, the, the old timers in Berks County and how rich and vibrant their Dutch was in comparison to the Mennonites, Lancaster County Dutch, which was a little bit more thin, more loan words. Um, and um, he just remembers how vibrant this Berks County Dutch dialect was when he was a, a, a young boy. And of course that community is, is growing in Berks County, right? You can still find lots of Dutch speakers in Berks County. Well, Maybe they, now they go to May instead of to the Cardiff, but um, there's still a thriving linguistic community there. And um, so maybe it's just a, a passing on of the baton in, in these kind of locations. Um, but some counties, you know, like, like Lehigh, they don't have that, they don't really have that plain presence in the same way that now Berks does due to the Lancaster County um, emigration. And, and that poses, 
you know, a different kind of set of conditions and um, linguistically. Now, culturally, of course, we still have all those tremendous artifacts. Um, cuisine, of course, always lasts and endures. It's hard to imagine when at a time when chicken pot pie is not going to be made. <laughs> I don't <laughs> want to be around. Pot. I don't want to live no. long enough to experience that. <laughs> I mean, I think in the year, you know, 2,300, people are going to be still debating whether a FOSMAC should have a cut in the middle or, or not. Um, but whether or not they're debating it in Deitch, um, perhaps not. Um, uh, and, and, and you see that, you know, that's also part of the change. So not only was were the fancy Dutch in Brooks County, they were so linguistically rich, that generation that overlapped with the old orders, um, but also culturally rich. And, um, you know, a, a very different culture from those those plain denominations. And I think that's something, too, that risks, you know, we, we know that losses, right? When people, you know, when I was a, a boy in New Jersey, I thought the Pennsylvania Dutch were just Amish, right? I didn't know, even know anything about fancy Dutch. Um, and it was only by moving to Berks County that I really started learning about the other major um, really the dominant and driving force of Pennsylvania Dutch culture historically. Um, so where is it going? I mean, in, in those two directions, it's, it's becoming plainer, <laughs> but um, it, it's still it's still being maintained. And um, I suppose one thing, you know, coming from the Irish perspective that that I was always a bit surprised of, you know, reading about Dutch was, was the lack of a kind of, I, I, I know we have the Grunzel Lodges and, and the Fasamlinga, but there was never quite the same political pressure um, to preserve Dutch uh, as a language in these communities as there was in Ireland or as there is in Brittany, for example, or in some of the um, dialects in France that have stronger local movements and political pressure groups behind them. Yeah, that that's a conversation that I know I've had with other colleagues of mine and, and, and where we think also, and this is kind of off topic, but at the same time, the, the state of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth doesn't do a very good job at promoting what they have here in the state. Definitely. Even, even, you can go as low level as tourism and say, well, you know, we could we could bring tourist money in if we promote this. But there's also the aspect of of saving and promoting a culture that is truly unique to the United States and truly unique to Pennsylvania from its from its roots. And I just don't I, I don't think the Commonwealth uh, on any level uh, is doing what they need to be doing but that's that's a political conversation and a lot goes you know it's 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 money you know it comes down to money is the money there is you know where's the money coming from etc cetera, etc cetera. but some of the money is there i mean you know what they did to bricks county they now call it the americana region i think that's that carries nothing to me what does that even mean the americana region it just makes it seem like plain vanilla um, we could have called it distal think country and that would have been, you know, richer, more interesting. Yeah, uh, Cause then somebody has to ask what's a distal think and then you can exactly. tell them and then pass the information. On. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I think some of it is there, you know, and, but Pennsylvania, as you, as you probably know, right. Uh, some of its identity was rooted in being anti Dutch. Uh, we're a state that has a requirement that all the school, school education needs to be delivered in English. And that came in really against the Pennsylvania Dutch. Um, and so there's there's always been this kind of, you know, the, the jostling in Pennsylvania um, and the power ultimately um, was in the hands of those English speakers. Um, and, uh, but I would love us, I would love, you know, to, to take a leaf out of some of the um, movements in Cajun French. Uh, I don't know if you're looking at them, but it, it, down there in Louisiana, they have French immersion schools, for example. I think that would be, a fascinating experiment to try in uh, Southeast Pennsylvania. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, this has all been cool mind bending stuff, but I, I end all of my conversations with 10 quick questions that are kind of like, all right, we're sitting on the front porch. We got, got our drink in our hand, whatever that is. And I'm just going to fire questions at you. You just answer them. You're, you're ready. Uh, here we go. All right. These are easy. These are easy. Number one, what is your morning drink of choice? Coffee. So your Irish background with tea didn't, or I mean, the Irish tend to be more tea drinkers, aren't they? That's true. That's true entirely. And uh, tea is, I'll drink more later on in the day, but okay. let's start the day with coffee. Yeah. Okay. All right. Number two. My mother would never drink tea though. No, my parents would never oh, drink. Okay. I mean, we would never drunk coffee, excuse me. Uh, okay. Yeah, so okay. I'm, I'm breaking the tradition there. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Number two, who is a go-to musical artist or group for you? Um, Bach. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> His latest album was great. <laughs> No, I'm a I huge like Bach. Things. I'm a huge Bach. Yeah, that's right. If it's old, the Dr. Morris <laughs> teaches it. I'm a huge fan of Bach too. Okay, great. Uh, number three, what movie can you watch over and over again and it doesn't get old? Well, we should say uh, Groundhog Day, shouldn't we? But uh, <laughs> given, given the month, um, um, Star Wars, I mean, episode four, that's infinitely oh, rewatchable. Yeah. Wonderful answer. Yes, very good. Uh, number four, this is okay. Given your job, this I'll be interested to hear what you say. What is the last thing that you read? Uh, like literally read? I, I read some job applications because we're doing a job search right now. <laughs> okay. But in, terms of, in terms of literature, I've been rereading um, uh, Manaith Me by the Roman comedian Plautus. I'm teaching a course on uh, classical story and translation at the moment, and we're doing Roman comedy. So since your background is literature, do you do you read for fun? Or like, is that your job? Like, reading's my job. When I'm not at work, I don't want to read. What, oh, I read it? for fun. I do read for fun. I mean, I like everybody else, at the end of the day, I'm a bit exhausted, so maybe I'll scroll, scroll the screen and look at the Facebook. Um, but um, in fun, I often turn it to... Uh, pretty trashy fiction. I was read, working through the James Bond series, for example, by Ian Fleming over the break. Uh, and uh, that was good fun. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Number five, what is your favorite pizza topping? Uh, pepperoni. Okay. Laying on the beach or going for a hike? Going for a hike. Me too. <laughs> me too. Yeah. Uh, okay. You've invited me over for dinner. What are you making? Uh, Mish tinkle. Tell everybody what that is. <laughs> Mish Tinkle is a recipe I got from uh, Terry Berger. Yes. Uh, and uh, it's, um, well, Mish Tinkle, I mean, if you translate it literally, it kind of means manure chicken, yep. which is a, a great phrase. But perhaps more accurately, maybe barnyard chicken might actually be a better <laughs> translation. But uh, it's kind of like, um, it's several meats wrapped. It's like a roulade. It's got like, I forget whether it's beef in the middle wrapped in chicken or it's, they're basically meat packets, meat yeah. wrapped in, uh, in meat. And uh, that two of the world's best things, meat yeah. and meat. So, uh... <laughs> I, if you're making mish tangle, I'll be over for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me, tell me one traditional Irish dish that you would make me if I came over. Oh, uh, a batting brack. Uh, that's kind of like a traditional Irish fruit loaf. Um, often made at um, for ceremonies like Halloween, people make batting brack, or new at um, New Year's Day, you'd make batting brack. It's simple, like a uh, yeast loaf with dried fruit in it. It's 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 not too sugary. It's kind of the ancestor of soda bread, um, but it's a little bit more interesting. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, oh, okay. So number eight. Uh, what is a dream vacation destination for you? Uh, Tuscany, Italy. Uh. That is beautiful. Pretty. That is pretty. All right. Uh, what is something you're afraid of? Ooh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid of heights. Okay. Um, and it's strangely, I, I'm not really afraid of heights so much for myself. I'm more afraid of heights for other people. Okay. So like, if my children, if we're gone for a hike and we're near an edge of a cliff and uh, my children want to go have a look over even though they're far away i still feel terribly scared so uh yeah i'm scared of that for sure all right last uh, the ferris wheel yeah uh at the top of the ferris wheel i'm always nervous for my kids <laughs> <laughs> all right Irrational. last last question what job other than one that you've had in your past would you love to have uh, a baker i think i would enjoy being a baker yeah, I enjoy baking things and making things and I enjoy eating things. So I would love that. <laughs> Sounds good. Lawrence, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. This conversation flew by. Holy cow. Um, thanks so just, much, Doug. Thanks for coming on, telling your story. I think it's such a fascinating, you know, it's not every day that you bump into a, an American that can speak fluent Gaelic and then yeah. also has greek and latin in their back pocket oh and they can pull out pennsylvania dutch too yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great it, I, I just i find you fascinating lawrence and i just really appreciate you to uh, agreeing to come up on the show and being on the front thanks part. so much for having me <laughs> all right take care you have a good night now 
Thank you for listening to Doug's Front Porch, a conversational podcast with your host, Doug Maidenford. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Five stars only, please. Follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just look for Doug's Front Porch. Also, please feel free to tell all of your friends about the show, and I'll see you all next time on My Front Porch. Thank you.